The Gitrash by Cole Webb Harder, read by the author. 1. When Father O'Day stepped off the bus, he paused for a moment to gaze upon the placid lake and the cold mountains which rose behind it, their sunlit peaks reflecting in the mirror of the water which still lay with the rest of the valley in the twilight of early morning. The orphans milled about on the mulch, waiting for Sister Ambrosia to lead them to their quarters and the barracks conjoined to the cloister. The air was cool and crisp, but deathly still. In the full light of the sun, Father O'Day's habit would shine pearly white, but in the shadow of the easterly mountains it was a hazy, grayish blue. The children were restless due to the long bus ride, but their pent-up energy was counterbalanced by the fatigue of an early rising and now they wandered listlessly, trying to clear their heads of the fog of sleep. But Father O'Day's mind was immune to such regressions. Years of sleepless nights, first in the Marines and then at the Abbey, had forced him to develop through strict self-discipline his more ethereal powers of perception, so that though he appeared more often than not lost in a kind of waking stupor, his eyes half open and his senses dulled, his interior eye was always watching, searching, helplessly aware of the mysterious world around him. His brothers at the Abbey attributed this clarity of mind to an unusually intense prayer life, but Father O'Day dismissed this theory as symptomatic of the religious priest's tendency toward hagiography and wishful thinking. I just do what I have to do, was his brief explanation to anyone who pressed him about it, for he was a man of few words and disliked idle chatter, especially if it concerned him. "'Well, come along, father,' barked the warden, a bearish woman resembling a lumberjack who, along with her emasculated husband Peter, ran the orphanage on a day-to-day -day basis. She trunched like an elephant across the mulch after the orphans, who were now filing into the barracks. Peter scurried behind her. Had Father O'Day not been her spiritual elder— thereby outranking her in the hierarchy of church-run bureaucracies, he would have been terrified in her presence, as nearly all the orphans and even some of the nuns were. She was a former police officer, like Father O'Day, an employee of the government turned servant of the church, and she had only suspicion of the children in her charge, whom she considered little more than criminals waiting to happen. The priest reached down to his feet and hoisted up a valise in one hand and a guitar case in the other, and hastened after the children to the barracks. Sister Ambrosia stood at the door, waiting for him, the children having disappeared down the corridor. "'Good morning, Father,' she said pleasantly. Father O'Day bowed his head slightly. "'Good morning, Sister.' He marched past her and down the hallway. Sister Ambrosia followed. "'Let me show you to your room, Father. No need. I know where it is.' He always stayed in the same quarters while at Chastity Lake, the smallest and most unassuming room on the northern side of the barracks closest to the chapel and the cloister. It had been built some time in the last century, and had not undergone much in the way of upkeep since. An ancient radiator was still used to heat the room, and the tiny bed still had springs. Sister Ambrosia continued to follow him down the corridor. There were huge glass windows running the length of the barracks on the east wall, the sun could be seen just peeking over the hills and casting the faintest of shadows on the western wall. "'Is there anything I can get you, father?' said the nun as she struggled to keep up. "'Yes, actually,' said the priest. "'You can take me to Sister Amelia.' "'Mother is in the chapel.' "'That's to be expected. Tell her I'm on my way.' He turned a corner, leaving Sister Ambrosia behind, and arrived at his quarters. He set down the guitar case, fiddled with the doorknob, and shoved the door open with a thrust of his shoulder. The wooden door frame had warped over the years, and the door would not budge without a little convincing. Upon entering, he plopped his luggage onto the bed. It was little more than a cot. The springs creaked, and the mattress bounced up and down. He opened the valise and unpacked the few possessions he had, and laid them neatly on the mattress. An extra habit, as white and unstained as the one he wore. A pipe and a tin of tobacco, a bag of basic toiletries, and finally a square frame covered by a pane of glass. Behind the glass was his shame, a purple heart with a golden border, and in the center of the heart the profile of George Washington. It had been awarded him after a stray bullet grazed his shoulder in the war. Just a scratch, really, he thought. There weren't even a scar. 
Like his rosary, which he carried in his pocket at all times, he brought the medal with him whithersoever he went to remind him that he had not yet suffered enough for the kingdom. He set the award on the bedside table, hung up the habit in the closet, and tossed the empty valise against the wall. The bag of toiletries he set on the countertop in the cramped little bathroom. Sister Amelia was waiting for him in the chapel. He popped the pipe and tobacco tin into his pocket. Again he struggled with the door and yanked it open. In the hallway a startled nun jumped at the noise. The priest had even more difficulty pulling the door shut again. 2. When Father O'Day entered the chapel, he saw the black shape of Sister Amelia kneeling alone in the very first pew. The chapel was rustic and appeared more to rise out of the rich mountainous earth than to be built upon it. The pews and rafters were carved from the trunks of the very fir trees which had once stood on the spot now occupied by the chapel. The smell of pine resin incense had worked its way into the wood and into the white drywall. Stained glass windows flanked the nave and dimmed all natural light which penetrated this high place to the Lord. A hefty granite altar imposed itself at the front of the church, situated on a platform three steps up from the floor of the nave, so that it was higher than the heads of all the congregation, even while standing. Behind this was an enormous crucifix carved of fur, and the mangled, starving form of Christ hung there in the blissful agony of his last breath. Father O'Day genuflected and made his way down the center aisle to Sister Amelia. As he approached, she raised her head and roused herself from prayer. Aiden, she sighed, never turning her face from the axe. Good morning, sister, said Father O'Day. He genuflected again and sat down next to her in the pew. She pushed herself up off the kneeler and eased herself under the hard wood. Her ancient body seemed to creak and snap as she moved, as if she were carved of the same wood as the tortured crucifix. Pleated flaps of skin sagged off her sharp bones and rolled down her forehead, creating deep crevices running this and that way across her physiognomy. She reached out a bony hand and groped at Father O'Day, searching for his face. Gently he took the hand and placed it just over his nose. She shook slightly as she felt his features. He noticed the blue blood vessels which marked her hand pulsating under the thin, yellowing skin. Finished, she removed her hand and pronounced her judgment. Not much has changed, my boy, she said. It's only been a few months, protested the priest. A few months is a mighty long time for someone of your delicate age, she said. Still, Sister Amelia did not turn away from the altar. As she sat there, enveloped by her black habit, she appeared to stare inexorably forward and eastward through the round, smoked spectacles which rested on her small, crooked nose. I am condemned to the stasis of old age. She sniffed the air loudly and smiled. More wrinkles broke out on her face. You've brought me some tobacco, haven't you? Indeed, said the priest. Let's go down by the lake and smoke it, she said gleefully. Mass is in an hour. Plenty of time. You know, you really shouldn't at your age. Bourgeois, I am a hundred and one years old. Nothing would have the audacity to kill me but the grace of God. Don't be such a prude, Father Aiden. Father O'Day gently helped her up by the elbow. Exiting the pew, the priest steadied the nun as they both genuflected. On their way down to the eastern bank of the lake, they passed a ramshackle chicken coop and a vegetable garden. Roosters strutted about pecking at each other while the hens fed on the seeds sown by one of the younger novices. Sister Amelia stalled, hearing the clucking of the chickens. How are they today, sister? she said, reaching out and clutching the rail of the garden's enclosing fence. A little sluggish, but healthy, said the nun. Sister Amelia mused on this. Mm, she droned. Be sure to lock the gate when you're through. Yes, sister. Sister Amelia and the priest continued their journey to the lake shore. Something's been gobbling up our chickens, she said. Every few days there's a bloody, feathery mess strewn all over their cage, the poor things. Is it a wolf? Or a coyote, maybe? Who knows? Some of the sisters have stayed up nights watching and waiting, but ain't none of them has seen a damn thing. The mulchy bank sloped down sharply as it ran into the lake. A wrought-iron bench sat wobbly-legged on the squishy dirt, looking out across the glassy water. The sun had begun to warm the surface of the lake, and faint clouds of vapor rose flamboyantly from the water. 
and were assumed into the cool air. Across the lake, some of the trees still hid in the shadows of the morning, sharp black stripes crowding the shore. What haints and mysteries hid within the gnarled branches and ancient trunks of the forest Father O'Day had often explored during his frequent visits to the convent. He patiently packed the bowl of the pipe. Soon a woodsy fragrant smoke was billowing from the mouth of Sister Amelia, who puffed happily on the stem. You are a kind boy, Father, she said. Some might say your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, the priest said. The nun coughed. <coughs> yes, well, every temple needs its incense. Very Chestertonian of you. St. Pius X once hauled a carousing renegade of a priest before him to tell him what's what. After their chat, the Pope gave him a pipe and some fresh tobacco. The priest refused. I'm afraid, Your Holiness, that is not my vice. Nonsense, said St. Pius, tis not a vice, for if it were, you would certainly have it. Sister Amelia was immensely pleased with herself. It's probably apocryphal, she said, but it reveals a great truth. Father O'Day smirked with bemused admiration. The sun continued to rise in the east. The indigo sky behind the mountains faded to a brilliant bright blue at zenith, and then to a blazing white as it collided with the sun. After a while, Father O'Day noticed that the stillness of the dawn air had given way to a gentle breeze which rustled the needles in the trees and caused small ripples on the surface of the lake to disrupt the near-perfect reflections of the mountains and the sky which now danced over the blue water. And Father O'Day, exulting in the cold wind, breathed in deeply through his nostrils, and the clarity of his mind discerned the panoply of mountain aromas, green pine needles, tree sap, rotting wood, fresh water, air brought from miles beyond the forest and laced with just a hint of gasoline fumes and other hallmarks of the city, the sweet scent of dry pipe tobacco and the freshly washed linens of Sister Amelia's habit. But there was a foreign scent, too, that the priest had never smelled before. It was not entirely unpleasant, but strange enough to give Father O'Day uneasy pause. It was very faint, imperceptible to a man with normal capabilities. Something wet and musty and earthy, like something hiding under the ground. He caught another whiff of the air, but could discern nothing else unusual on the wind. The water of the lake lapped at the shore. Such great mystery, Father O'Day thought, in all the creatures I see before me. At length, a single toll rang from the chapel's bell tower and echoed across the valley, half an hour before Mass. "'Come, sister,' said Father O'Day. "'I'll help you back to the chapel.' "'Thank you, Father,' she said, rising. In the vestibule of the chapel, Father O'Day removed his shoulder cape and folded it neatly. Then, from a tiny closet, he removed a surplice, raised it over his head, and let it fall snugly over him. As he prayed the vesting prayers, his mind was drawn back across the centuries to St. Norbert, the founder of his order, and his disciples living in huts in the valley of Premontre, to that Christmas day, almost a millennium past, when the first canons donned the white habit. It was cold, Father Uday imagined, and wet like the dewy morning, the dawning of a new, secret, intimate way of life. This life had cascaded down the ages, barely noticed by the world, and had found him, Father Aidan, and now he too carried the secret in his bosom, and the cold wind of mercy blew through his heart and whispered to him the hidden things of the matter around him. Father O'Day draped a stole around his neck, then clothed himself with a green cope. The vestibule was crowded now with acolytes preparing candles and incense. He could hear the orphans shuffling into the pews and the sisters processing quietly into the choir stalls. Sister Baquita began a prelude on the organ. It all seemed appropriately medieval to Father O'Day. And the liturgy began as it had for some two thousand years with procession into the chapel. The fragrance of incense mixed with the aroma of pine needles and a thick cloud of smoke filled the nave. As Father O'Day reached the altar, he noted the children standing in the pews. 
Some stood in silence and bowed reverently as he passed. Others squirmed uncomfortably and shifted from one leg to another. Still others whispered to their compatriots or snickered at the theatricality of the ritual. The warden stood at the back of the chapel like one of the mighty pine trees which had been felled to build the chapel. Her husband slouched next to her. The sisters began the asperges. Father O'Day looked up to the rafters. Some bird, a swallow, perhaps, was making its nest above one of the windows. Thou shalt sprinkle me, O Lord, with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. The stained glass windows glue as bright morning sunlight passed through them. And I shall go unto the altar of God, to God who gives joy to my youth. A draft stirred the yellow flames of the altar candles, six of them in a neat row, and Father O'Day passed through the fullness of time as he had almost every day for ten years. History was a spiral, and in the center he stood arms upraised at the moment of consecration. Sister Baquita's accompaniment swelled to a crescendo, and the bells sounded to announce the presence of the Lord. The Mystery of Faith It was then that Father O'Day remembered his brother Hiram and the orchard back at home. As children, he and Hiram would run, bounding through the apple trees and splashing through the shallow streams which marked the border of their property. Hiram had married and taken over management of the orchard and brought his new wife there to tend the garden with him, the peaceful life of country living. But Jason, for that was his given name, was a restless soul and had sought adventure in the wide world. When he returned home from the Middle East with his purple heart, prohibited under pain of death from discussing his adventures with anyone, he had learned of the death of his father only months before his return. His last words as he lay gasping for air on his deathbed had been cryptic and disquieting. Jason, Jason, he had croaked, the mountains shall keep you to the end of days. Then his throat had closed, and his eyes bulged, and he had lain still in an almost animated contortion, like those frozen bodies of Pompeii, caught in the horror of their last thoughts. Nobody had had the foggiest idea what the old man's words had meant. The mountains shall keep you to the end of days. Whatever it meant, it couldn't be good, Father O'Day thought. Was he doomed, like the wandering Jew? Cursed to roam the mountains destitute until the apocalypse. Corpus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi custodiat animum tuam in vit meternam. Amen. The mass concluded in solemnity. Sister Amelia stood and recited an ancient prayer of their order as the priests and acolytes processed out of the chapel. The nightfall brought a sudden dampness. Fog settled on the lake. Father O'Day retired relatively early. Sister Ambrosia was given the night watch over the chicken coop. Father O'Day drifted off to sleep, listening to the sounds of the forest at night. The hoot of an owl echoed off the stone walls of the mountains. Crickets chirped rhythmically, lulling the priest into slumber. He heard the breeze whistling through the trees and the wood of the burrocks creaking. He closed his eyes and in the blackness perceived the color green. Then his consciousness evanesced, and the priest slept. Sleep was anything but restful for Father O'Day, because he had trained himself to roam far and wide in his dreams, seeking out bits of hidden knowledge. Sometimes he prayed. In any event, his mind was always alert, even in the grave of sleep. Before the Lord humbled him, he considered himself something of a psychonaut, exploring different levels of consciousness and penetrating the vaults of the human mind. But then on one of his excursions he was accosted by a man, or so he seemed, dressed all in black and hiding his face with a black mask. He had struck Aiden to the ground, but instead of landing, he continued to fall and fall until his stomach turned inside of him and he lost all sense of direction. Then the voice of the black man boomed out around him, the wisdom of man is the foolishness of God, and you presume, O priest, to know the dreams and longings of man, whose race God deigned to join and raise to divinity? Because of this you must serve me and love me and be blessed with the kiss of my friendship. 
He had been humbled, but he had not yet received the kiss of friendship. That night, Father Rodet had just embarked on a new dream, in which a star plummeted from heaven and shattered into a million pieces when he was awakened abruptly. What was it, he thought? A noise? He listened long and hard. No, not a noise, but a smell. A pungent, wet, earthy smell like that which he had detected at the lake the previous morning, although now it was strong and immediate. Father O'Day got out of bed and shoved the door to his room open and peered outside. The corridor was dark and silent. The priest ventured out into the hall, treading softly and listening for any unusual noises. The smell was all around him to the point where he coughed and had to start breathing through his mouth. He knew his senses were keen, but could no one else smell this? Finally, he heard a rustle and a twig snap out in the woods. Something furry and heavy was shuffling through the trees just outside the barracks. He hurried now to the porch and found Sister Ambrosia sitting in a wooden chair wrapped in bundles and sipping a cup of coffee. It occurred to Father Day that it was very, very cold. Good morning, Sister, he said. Sister Ambrosia smiled. Hello, Father, she sighed. What time is it? Oh, long about two, I'd imagine. He stood on the porch, gazing at the moonlit lake. The smell was overpowering. He could hear that the other animals were hushed, as if they sensed a threat. Have you seen anything tonight? he asked. Huh, scoffed the nun. Not a thing. Sister Amelia says catching our chicken thief is a fool's errand. Sister Amelia may be very old, said Father O'Day absently, but nothing is impossible with God. Sister Ambrosia was silent. Father O'Day listened. Can you smell that? he said. Smell what? There is something out there. He heard a snap in the trees. His curiosity overtaking his caution, he leapt off the porch and started jogging toward the chicken coop. Sister Ambrosia followed. The priest heard a rustling in front of him, wings flapping, flesh tearing. Hurry, sister, he called over his shoulder. He nearly tripped as he ran over the uneven ground. He could see his warm breath forming little white clouds of condensation in front of him. Even with his sharp eyes, he could barely see in front of him through the bank of fog. When he finally reached the chicken coop, he froze and stared. Bloody feathers lay strewn all over the ground. He nearly fainted from the potent stench of the attacker. Through the murky darkness, he could see a black shape snarling, its jaws tight around a poor bird's neck, shredding it to pieces. As if it sensed being watched, the animal stopped suddenly, growled and snorted, and then, taking its prey with it, the beast mounted the fence and leapt into the forest. To Father O'Day, its quick and limber movements made it seem more like a small horse than any predator with which he was familiar. He heard Sister Ambrosia rushing up behind him. Don't scream, he said roughly. Sister Ambrosia approached with caution. Lord have mercy, she said. She lifted the latch and entered the bloody chicken coop. The surviving hens clucked nonchalantly. Sister Ambrosia knelt down and cradled one of the mutilated carcasses lying twisted in the ground. The poor things, she cooed. Father O'Day was quiet. We didn't even eat them. The nun stood up and let the little body fall. What was it? Father O'Day shook his head. I don't know. He said, you should keep the chickens inside. Yourselves, too. Father O'Day felt the cold dampness enveloping him. He felt his shirt, which was wet with fog. In the dim light, he could see his breath, and a few feet away, the cloud of Sister Ambrosia's breath. The nun's habit was smeared with chicken blood. You should go to bed, he said. Yes, father. She turned slowly and began to walk back towards the barracks. Father O'Day called after her without turning away from the bodies. And tell Sister Amelia not to expect me at breakfast tomorrow. The priest listened. The night was still for miles around. No beast or insect stirred. Far away, a few cars coasted across the highway. Three. Father O'Day left just as the sun was rising. The mountains blocked most of the sunlight, and only a faint glow in the eastern sky announced the dawn of a new day. He left his habit in the closet, and instead ventured forth in civilian clothes more suited for hiking. With some dismay, but little surprise, he found that the night's fog had not dissipated. The forest was cold and wet, bringing out the sappy pine odor in the trees. 
He started at the chicken coop and followed his quarry's musty scent wherever it led him. He carried an old bowie knife and a rosary in his pocket. His nose led him into the trees up a mild incline. Soon he was out of sight of the convent. The mulchy ground squished under his heavy boots. The priest had many gifts and talents, but stealth was not one of them. He had known men twice his size in the military who could have traversed the entire mountain ten times and left barely a broken branch as evidence. Some once heard show tune had lodged in his brain, and he hummed a little as he walked. At intervals, the scent grew weak, and he readjusted his course to regain the trail. The priest gave no care to getting lost, even in the fog which made every part of the forest much like the last, for he had an impeccable sense of direction. At some point he stopped. There he calculated that he must have been afoot for an hour or two. He could hear the nuns rising from their beds as clearly as if he were within the cloister. He heard Sister Amelia scolding a novice for not making her bed properly. Birds began to wake up now, and he heard animals moving incautiously through the trees. Whatever threat had silenced the woodland creatures last night did not now seem present. Following the scent, he at length came across a small creek trickling down toward the lake. There he knelt for a quick drink. He was surprised at the relative warmth of the water. Upon rising from the stream, he noticed the smell had weakened. He walked a few yards to the east, but found it even weaker. He tried another direction and found it still weaker. After searching for a few minutes, he was dismayed to discover that he had completely lost the trail. Father O'Day sighed and frowned. Now he could hear the nuns chanting lauds in the chapel. The fog glowed white now as the sun began to peek over the mountains. He shook his head, angry with himself for losing the scent. Exasperated, he sat down on a cold rock. After some deliberation, he decided he would head back towards the barracks. He began walking down the mountain, circling around the north side of the lake in the direction from which he came. A deer crossed his path. Father O'Day had heard it coming, but the deer was surprised. Both of them stopped and stared at each other for a long moment. With some alarm, Father O'Day noticed that the deer was bleeding from a small but deep gash in its haunch. He figured the wound would probably be fatal. The deer blinked once and then continued its limping way through the woods. The priest started walking again. The fog had not lifted at all. Turning slightly to the left, he saw something he had not seen on the ascent, a small pile of feathers at the base of a tree. Father O'Day knelt down to inspect it. The feathers were attached to a bloody chunk of meat. He frowned, confused. The flesh was almost buried under the dirt, indicating that it had been there for quite some time. But he was sure that it had not been there when he passed by earlier. His suspicions roused, Father O'Day glanced around him looking for familiar sights. Nothing stood out, but then again he'd not been paying close attention on the way up. Now he heard the nuns eating breakfast down below. He decided he would follow the noises of the convent back rather than trust his sense of direction. First time for everything, I suppose. He began to walk toward the direction of the noise. Oddly, though, he thought, the din of the nuns and children at breakfast did not seem to be growing louder as he neared. It seemed to be staying constant, if not slowly fading away. Soon enough, he noticed that the downhill slope he had been traveling had subtly changed to the slightest of uphill slopes. Father O'Day was alarmed. This was not right. He should have arrived at the convent before the east mountain ran into the west. He whirled around and began trekking back toward the east. The incline again switched with no sign of the convent. Father O'Day took a deep breath to focus his thoughts. He listened. Silence. The sounds of the nun's morning revelry had faded away. The birds were quiet. It seemed as if nothing moved for miles. Father O'Day began to get a bad feeling. He felt the hair stand up on the back of his neck when he realized he couldn't even hear the distant highway. The fog had gotten thicker. So thick that he couldn't see the glow of the sun in the sky above. For the first time in a number of years, he felt fear creeping up on him. All his powers and gifts had failed him, and he was lost. Four. The fear sent a tremor down Father O'Day's spine, which evoked a stirring in his gut, which aroused an impression, and then a memory. Then the memory of another mountain in another place long ago. 
It was night, but a certain night, portentous and heavy, and it rested like a vestigial organ somewhere below his left kidney. Now it was on the prowl again, coming for him, and once again he entered into the memory inwardly to confront it. The blackness behind his closed eyelids slowly took on a form, the form of headlights on a narrow, winding road. He found himself behind a blotchy windshield, squinting as faded yellow and white lines lighted up and passed way under the hood of his car. It was a certain night. The date, he knew, and could not forget, was November 4th, 2008. The future priest turned his head and looked at the sleeping girl in the passenger seat, Rebecca. She had wild yellow hair and olive skin, just as she had every time. Just as well she sleeps, Jason thought. She would never have come if she knew we were going up the mountain. This was the only paved road up the mountain. The mountain. There were many mountains above their valley, but this was the mountain. Normally, he was as wary as anyone of its slopes and summit, but there was something he had to show her. It was a matter of duty. So while his family sat stupefied before a television screen, waiting for the senator from Arizona to concede the election to the senator from Illinois, Jason was in this certain place, approaching his destination. The road gave way to rock and gravel, and he brought the car to a stop near the railing. They were high up, overlooking the valley, which was obscured by a thick layer of clouds, an ominous relic of the old world. A blue call box reflected the headlights. Jason turned the key in the ignition, and blackness rushed from every side to fill the void. Rebecca stirred in her seat, groaned, and mussed her hair. Sorry, I fell asleep. It's okay. We're here. Where's here? she mumbled. Jason paused. This was the hard part. The mountain, he said. She sat up straight, suddenly awake. What? It's okay. Her breathing accelerated, and she reached for the door handle. Why the hell would you bring us up here? What's the matter with you? Her deep voice ran shrill, and she flailed in the darkness looking for an escape. He gripped her wrists to subdue her. It's okay. We're safe in here. He got her to breathe with him. The initial jolt of fear subsided, and her eyes filled with sleepy unease. She slouched into the passenger seat again, and he released her hands. She glanced out each of the blackened windows, then at Jason. Why'd you bring us here? Her voice quivered a little. Jason smiled and said, I want to show you something. She exhaled in short spurts. Okay. Jason looked at his watch. I reckon it'll be long in about 90 seconds. He pressed the button to set a timer. She glared at him. Well, I see you've done your homework. And she laid her head against the headrest. The dark breath of silence passed between them. Crickets chirped outside. A whisper moved the trees and the long grass on the slopes. A subtle, airy hiss underscoring the musical insects. Jason heard his heartbeat accelerating. Reliving it now, Father O'Day wondered what had caused this excitement. Leave now, he wanted to tell himself, before anything happens. But his mind and body were bound by the truth. It occurred to Jason that he was hungry. Grapes, he said, turning to Rebecca. She nodded. Sure. Jason reached under his seat and produced a bag of grapes, offered them to her. She put one in her mouth and chewed, made a face. Mm, they're lukewarm. She handed the bag back. I'm sorry, he said. That's okay. She seemed to be relaxing now. Although, you know, she said with a wry twinkle in her eye, if we were in a more civilized place, I could warm them up. Their eyes met. Crickets sang in the bush. Jason leaned in and they kissed. It was simple and honest. I had a long time coming. The hissing of the wind was interrupted by the beeping of Jason's watch. They broke apart. It's time, he said, and silenced the alarm. He sat facing forward, and Rebecca did the same. Listen, he told her. The monotonous clicks of crickets began to slow and coalesce into patterns. Soon, harmonies grew into melodies, and the mountainside was filled with an ethereal tune, oscillating back and forth, the crickets singing an antiphonal symphony. 
Jason turned to Rebecca. Do you remember the rumors? Lulled into a meditative state by the sounds, she said, Hmm? About the lights on the mountain? She thought, Yeah, they're all true. His voice was grave and solemn. Fact compelled him. The time had come, and the night opened. They were blinded by a sudden flash of white that darted across the windshield. A deafening sound like a train passing or a fan pushing air in rhythm made the car vibrate. At first, Rebecca held up her hand to shield her eyes from the beam. Jason stared into it. Then the white light broke and gave way to deep blues and rich greens. The colors fanned out and danced to the cricket's song, red and purple and pink and other more vibrant hues for which Father O'Day still had no name. They flew up and down above the valley just over a small hillock on the mountain's side. It felt like falling, Father O'Day thought. Such was its beauty. Jason watched Rebecca. Her eyes were wide, and she smiled an innocent smile, like a child laughing for the first time. These lights and these sounds, strange as they were, softened hearts and dispelled the cynicism, if only for a moment, which accumulates with age. Jason looked again and saw she was crying, tears of unbounded eternal joy, and then it stopped, and the blackness returned, and everything was silent. Jason looked at his watch. Several hours had passed. What was that? she said, awe still in her voice. I don't know, Jason said. Nobody does, apparently. Thank you, she whispered, for showing me that. Her voice was airy and far away was worth coming up here. She chuckled, nervous, and gasped. In the hours which had passed unnoticed, Jason realized his bladder had filled. Once again, Father O'Day tried to stop himself from doing what he was about to do, but as always, it was impossible. The outcome was predetermined. He pulled the keys out of the ignition and opened the driver's door. Rebecca called after him. Her piece shattered once again. Where are you going? Relax, I'm just gonna go piss in the bushes. Well... She choked. Don't leave me in here. It's okay. I'm just going over yonder into those trees. Well, she stuttered. Just lock the door, so I'll be right back. He got out and slammed the door. He heard the doors lock behind him. Damn, it was cold that night, Father O'Day thought. He felt the brisk air on his younger skin as he ventured into the darkness, shivering, overcome by the call of nature. The trees were actually much further than he figured. He had to wade downhill through brush and long grass for about five minutes before he found an adequate shelter. At the base of an enormous fir tree, he unzipped his pants and felt relief. The needles above him hissed. He noticed that the crickets were silent. How long have they been so? Father O'Day still had no idea. Far away, he heard a train whistle moan. Then much closer, what sounded like crunching leaves. A bear? Maybe? Person? He was starting to get the creeps. And then, out of the vast emptiness, loud clicking, like wood creaking, but mechanical also, like switches turning on and off. Father O'Day hadn't remembered this before. It seemed to be in every direction, hovering on the air. Enough, he thought. He zipped up his pants and began the journey uphill to the car. The sound of crickets returned and a threat seemed to neutralize, but when he reached the road, his heart stopped, and his stomach dropped. The car was gone. Not a trace of it or the girl, only a dim moon covered by clouds and the blue call box catching its reflection. Rebecca? He felt his pocket. His keys were where he'd left them. She couldn't have driven away. He ran a pace down the curve in the road. Rebecca! He shouted. His voice echoed against the slopes of the mountain. He stood in the cold air and closed his eyes. There it was, fear. The same fear he felt now, alone in the woods above Chastity Lake. The memory faded and disappeared into the darkness behind his eyes. It settled in its usual spot, and Father O'Day was transported back to that lonely clearing in the trees. Five. He stood in that one spot for a long time, 
Eventually, Father O'Day summoned his willpower to move. He was about to cross out of the clearing and back into the trees when he heard a twig snap behind him. He whirled about and stared at a thick tree trunk across the clearing. He knew he was being watched, but he waited for a long time before he said, Who's there? A wind blew towards him, and then from behind the tree emerged a splash of color. To his amazement, he saw the form of a little girl materialize, no more than four feet tall, and wearing a red and white dirndl dress. Her skin was pale white and ashen, and her hair fell in gorgeous strawberry blonde curls around her shoulders. Is this a visit or a visitation, he said. The little girl said nothing, but chewed on the nail of her pinky finger. After a thought, the priest stepped toward her. She backed away in proportion. It's okay, he said. I'm not going to hurt you. The little girl took her finger out of her mouth and squinted at him. Are you lost too, he asked, and took another step toward her. She shook her head. From this distance, Father O'Day could see red marks and bruises on her arms. Are you okay? The little girl, noticing the object of his gaze, straightened up and cocked her head defiantly. Right as rain, she mumbled. Father O'Day frowned. Where are you from? Where are your parents? Now the little girl frowned. My daddy's out hunting. What's it to you? Ah, thought Father O'Day. The plot thickens, but he said, Do you live out here? She nodded over her shoulder and resumed gnawing on the fingernail. Back up the hill a ways. Curious, Father O'Day had never heard of anyone living in the mountains above Chastity Lake. Can you show me, he asked. Show you what? Where you live. For the first time, she smiled. Oh, boy, I sure can. Daddy loves company. There was some hidden meaning, a certain insincerity in the way she said the last that made Father O'Day somewhat apprehensive about this daddy of hers. She led the priest up the hill from the clearing, further away from where Father O'Day thought the lake ought to have been. The little girl walked quickly up the slope, several yards ahead, bounding over the rocks and patches of uneven terrain like an adept mountain-dwelling animal. Father O'Day struggled to keep up. Slow down, he called. The little girl didn't listen to him, but continued leaping forward into new clumps of trees. Father O'Day was running out of breath. It had been a long time since the mountains of Afghanistan. A sweat broke out on his forehead, and in the chilly, humid air, it made his skin febrile and clammy. The slope began to level. They hopped over a tiny stream, slithering through the dirt. Hurry up, she barked. Daddy's killed something. Go ahead, he grunted. I'm coming. He heard the little girl's footsteps ahead of him and followed. Soon the trees parted and Father O'Day saw a dark gray house looming over him. The building seemed to be in great distress. Planks of wood dangled from the roof, barely attached. Glassless window frames sagged and the whole house seemed to sink on its foundation into the mountain. Father O'Day stopped short and nearly gagged when a gust of wind brought that musty, moribund smell he had been chasing all morning. But now it was stronger, even overpowering, and mingled with the scent of fresh blood. The priest scanned the scene before him. The little girl stood on the porch, grinning at him. Daddy got us a deer, she said. Indeed. As Father O'Day approached, he saw the bloody, mutilated corpse of a yellow deer. He knew it was the poor deer whose path he had crossed earlier. It had the same gash on its flank, and he recognized its scent. Father O'Day breathed through his mouth and stepped through a cloud of scavenging flies to examine the body. He squatted on his heels and held his hand to his face to shield himself from the smell. The animal had been killed by a blow to the neck with a sharp object. Its fur was stained red and a pool of already drying blood spread across the mulch. Worms swam in the muddy puddle. The deer's limbs had been severed and lay in a pile next to the round body. Father O'Day had done his fair share of hunting, even skinned an animal once, but this was unusually grisly. He examined the deer's tail, which was also stained. Its anus was bloody and torn. Father O'Day stood up. He had seen enough, and he was beginning to suspect something that couldn't possibly be true, though it was consistent with everything he had seen. The girl was grinning wickedly at him. Come inside, she said. Is your daddy home? I think so, but some people don't react so kindly to him. This Father O'Day did not doubt in the slightest. He stepped onto the porch. 
It creaked and buckled beneath him as though it might collapse under his weight and send him plummeting into some horrible death beneath the earth. Is your daddy going to eat that? Father O'Day nodded toward the corpse. Sooner or later, said the little girl. Her smile widened, and she walked through the lopsided front door. When he crossed over the threshold, Father O'Day coughed as he inhaled a sickening fume filled with dust, wood chips, and cobwebs. The smell was even stronger inside. Daddy, called the little girl. Daddy? No answer. In the gloom, Father O'Day saw the shades of rotting furniture and the sad face of what used to be a fireplace. Yellowed paper and deformed crayons lay strewn over the floor. Father O'Day noticed a sheet at his feet, and he bent to pick it up. He rose, choking on the dust kicked up by the displacement of the paper. His eyes watered, and he sneezed. His throat stung as he tried to breathe. When his vision and airways cleared, he examined the crayon drawing on the sheet. Two figures, hand in hand, one taller, the other shorter. The shorter figure sported yellow curls and wore a billowing red and white skirt, like a head atop an umbrella, obviously the little girl. But the taller figure had short, straight, and white hair and wore a slim red dress with sleeves. Who is this? he asked. Who? The little girl sat on the floor and played with a pile of wood chips. The lady. Father O'Day showed her the drawing and pointed at the tall figure. Oh, she said and smiled. That's Daddy. Father O'Day frowned. That's your father? No, Father. Daddy. He looked at the picture again. He used to be a woman, but his spirit got too small. Her countenance sank into melancholy. He forgot how to change back. She trailed off and sighed. Then a gust of wind blew through the front door and scattered the dust and the papers. The priest coughed. He felt the malevolent presence behind him before he heard the low growl. The girl's eyes lit up, and she jumped to her feet. Daddy! She ran past Father O'Day toward the door. The priest turned around, and in the doorframe he recognized the shape of an enormous black dog, nearly half his own height. The little girl kissed its snout and stroked fur. I missed you, Daddy. The priest's eyes widened. So my suspicions were true, he thought. The animal's gaze fixed on Father O'Day, its white eyes burning with hatred for him. The creature snarled and bared its long white teeth. A glob of drool dripped from its jaws and onto the little girl's dress. She giggled. Father O'Day's heartbeat raced. It was all he could do to keep from trembling. The beast growled and snapped its jaws, never taking its eye off Father O'Day. What's that, Daddy? she said. The creature barked and she nodded. Okay. Then she looked at the priest. He wants to talk. She extended her bruised arm before the creature's jaws. It opened its mouth and in a swift motion sank its teeth into the girl's arms. Father O'Day jumped, startled. Yes! screamed the little girl. Her eyes rolled backward in her head. Blood trickled from her fresh wound and onto the floor. And then she spoke again. Are you scared yet, Father Aiden? she said. Her voice was low and hollow. The priest took a deep breath, felt the dust drying his throat. How do you know me? We've met before. Or we have a friend in common. Let her go. The beast snarled and the little girl's body spasmed. I am not some demon for you to command, she said. Who are you? Silence. Who are you? I was the spirit of the lonely places. You knew me by many names. The beast's jaws tightened on the girl's arm, and a stream of blood shot into the air. I made poor men rich. I ruled principalities. I sat in the seat of power. But now I am just a lonely soul, with nobody and nowhere to call home. Father O'Day took a step toward the creature. Why aren't you wearing your habit, father? The girl's voice lightened. Are you ashamed? The priest said nothing. The little girl cackled and the beast growled, Down in hell we only eat each other. Are you ready to join us, Father? Father O'Day marked the creature's breathing. Protruding ribs covered in black, shaggy fur heaved up and down. He focused his attention past the noises of the beast's wheezing at the center of its chest. Then he heard an enormous heart beating faster than his own and he realized this great hellhound was afraid of him, too. Father O'Day summoned his courage and smiled. Have you been stealing the sister's chickens, he said. The beast's eyes flashed. I, too, must eat, the little girl said. I am but a man. Father O'Day nodded. I think, he said, 
Now I'm beginning to understand what is happening today. The little bitch thought we could eat you, said the girl. But she didn't know. Know what? That you reek of the flesh of your god. Fuck him! The girl's voice grew angry, and the beast's jaws tightened on her arm. Blood spurted onto the floor. Father O'Day stepped closer, and the beast moaned low. You must let her go, he said. But how will I speak, said the girl. Creatures without the use of reason have no cause to speak. How long have you been free? The creature snarled, its eyes white-hot, pupils narrow. Its heart thumped louder and faster. No answer. Father O'Day reached into his pocket, felt the rosary and the knife. What will you do? shouted the girl. Father O'Day pulled the knife from his pocket and opened it. The creature's mouth filled with bubbling froth. Its breaths shortened and grew louder. Panic seemed to seize it. Do you feel that? the girl said, and Father O'Day recalled the wooden clicking he heard in the woods so many years ago. That's the fury of my fire, the lightning of my burning spirit. Now, more than ever, it was a battle not of bodies or of words, but of fear. Father O'Day felt his heart accelerating and a cold sweat breaking out on his forehead. This is the end, he said. You must let her go. Blood was pooling on the floor under the girl. Don't you want to know who I am? What my true name was? You'll be very pleased. Father O'Day measured his breath and said, No, he shrugged. I don't care. The beast opened its jaws and the little girl fell limp to the floor. Then it howled and leapt at the priest. A great force pushed him up against the wall and he felt the animal's teeth in his right arm. Bones snapping, sinews twisting. Then he was airborne and landed head first on the floor. Dust and splinters blinded him, and he felt the creature's hot breath on his neck. The knife was still in his hand, though. Time seemed to slow as he focused his powers of perception on every movement, every contraction of every muscle in the approaching animal's body. Staring up into its drooling jaws, he raised his good arm and felt hot blood scalding his hand. He gritted his teeth through the pain and pulled the knife up and to the left. Heat upon heat in his hand and boiling blood and steam gushed from the animal's body. The beast howled once, like a tea kettle screaming under pressure, then fell to the floor with a thud. The house shook, and some of the floorboards cracked under the weight. Then it was quiet. Dust drifted on the stagnant air. Father O'Day looked at his arm and saw that it was flayed from elbow to wrist, gushing blood. The shattered bone protruded in several places. He sat up and winced and then pulled himself to his feet. The corpse of the huge black beast lay on the floor in a pool of blood. He saw the bowie knife lodged in the jugular of the animal. Father O'Day approached the body, and with his uninjured hand fastened his grip on the hilt of the knife. It stuck. Behind Father O'Day, the little girl began to stir. He heard her standing up. Daddy, she said. Father O'Day pulled again, and the knife came free. He stumbled when it exited the wound and wiped the blade on his pant leg. The girl toddled to his side and stared at the body. You killed Daddy, she whimpered. Yes, I think I did, said Father O'Day. With his good hand, the priest struggled to slice off a piece of his shirt. The fabric tore. He put the knife away and ripped the rest with his hand. Then he wrapped the wound with the fabric. You killed Daddy. Here, said Father O'Day, let me help your arm. She stepped backward. Don't touch me, Christ, Diggy. Father O'Day made the sign of the cross in her direction and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, shut up! The little girl shut her mouth. Father O'Day resumed, now hold still. He tore off another swatch of cloth from his shirt and tied it around her arm. They both turned and beheld the vile creature before them. The priest had the feeling that some great drama had come to an end, that some ancient evil which existed long before him had finally been vanquished, though he could not remember how. He noticed that the light in the room had changed, and he took the little girl by the hand, and together they stepped outside into the forest. The clouds had dissipated, and now the forest was filled with golden shafts of light, layer upon layer in front of them as they marched down the slope. The sound of the nuns in the valley filled Father O'Day's ears. He heard Sister Ambrosia watering plants and the nearby clucking of chickens. His senses had returned. Above them in the trees a group of swallows wheeled and chirped. When they reached the bottom of the slope, the trees thinned. Sister Ambrosia, watering the vegetable garden, looked up to see two bloodied, beaten figures materialize out of the foliage. One she barely recognized, and the other she didn't recognize at all. She put her hand to her mouth and gasped. My God, she said, Father O'Day, what happened? The priest sighed. 
You'll not be having any more trouble with your chickens, he said. The police and paramedics were summoned. One of the medics tried to ask the little girl what had happened. She's mute, said Father O'Day. She's been stricken thusly for her blasphemies. The medic stared at him. She's had a rough time of it, probably abused, sexually and otherwise, from a young age. They took them both to the hospital, where Father O'Day was subjected to a number of painful procedures. They set his arm in a cast and gave him a round of rabies shots and a bottle of antibiotics to take home. He returned to the empty orphanage around nine o'clock. What about the girl? the priest asked the officer who escorted him. Has she spoken yet? The officer shook his head. I'll see to it, said Father O'Day. When he reached his bedroom, he changed and went directly to bed. Before long he was asleep and dreamt again of a masked figure who anointed him with extra virgin olive oil and kissed his palms. He struggled, but found himself unable to move. Six. He awoke with a start and a sweat. He jerked his broken arm and hollered in pain. He looked at the digital clock on the nightstand next to his bed. 3.30. Father O'Day groaned. He sat up and swung his legs over the side of the bed. Attempting to clear the sleep from his eyes, he rubbed his face with his left hand. His forehead came away wet. Startled, he looked down at his hands. It was too dark to see anything. He stood up and switched the light on. His hands were covered in blood, oozing out of a hole in the palm of each hand. The priest rolled his eyes. You've got to be kidding me. He watched the blood trickle onto the floor. This was the last straw. He threw open the door to his bedroom, marched down the hallway toward the chapel, leaving a trail of blood behind him. When he reached the chapel, he went immediately to the sacristy. He fumbled around in the dark for a few minutes. Finally, his hand brushed against a small golden key. Clutching it tightly, he stormed down the center aisle and ascended the steps to the sanctuary. He wormed his way behind the altar and unlocked the door of the tabernacle. He opened it and stared at the ciborium full of consecrated hosts. He heaved a great sigh. All right, he said. You win. You finally win. He held up his left hand and presented it to the ciborium. Just give Giovanna a break and make it stop bleeding until I can get a few bandages. The flow halted, and the wounds crusted over. Father O'Day huffed. Thank you, he said. Have a good night. He locked the tabernacle and genuflected. Then he walked back to his room. He went to the bathroom and switched on the light. The wounds in his palms appeared to tunnel all the way through to the other side. He poked one of the holes with his fingers and winced. It was tender. He shook his head in exasperation. Unbelievable. He switched off the light, then made his way to the window by his bed. He shoved it open and breathed in the city air. Yellow street lamps glowed dimly over the streets surrounding the orphanage. Father O'Day wondered what weird and wonderful things were happening out there in all that dark. The world was a strange place, he thought. So many things hidden in secret behind locked doors, in dark alleyways, and deep in the thick of the woods. They had managed to keep the wild at bay for some time with their houses and their roads and their civilization. But the wild was still there, lurking around the edges waiting for a lapse in vigilance to strike. Glory to God for all things, the priest sighed. Then he closed the window and went back to bed.